Okay, I'll, uh, I have a lot of information. I'll be going quickly. Um, it's irrigation, so there's math, and I'll be explaining some of the stuff as we go through. Don't keep notes on any of the math. Don't worry about it, because I'm going to show you a tool at the end of my presentation that does all the math for you. You don't have to do any of the math. It's so kind of a neat tool. And if anybody's interested, there's also irrigation manuals. I'm sure Washington State has them all as well. But you kind of have to go through the math a little bit to understand where you're heading with irrigation. So, so just quickly, uh, you know, why do we irrigate? How much water can the soil store? How much water can be applied at one time? We'll talk about irrigation efficiencies. How do we apply it? How often scheduling all of that? So why do we irrigate? Well, number one, you want to grow a crop. If we have enough rainfall and the rainfall comes at the right time of the year, you don't need to irrigate. But that doesn't happen, so we sometimes have irrigation as an insurance policy, but more often because we want to grow a crop that is worth more, higher value, larger volumes, all of that. And we do that by replenishing our soil moisture. And you'll see as I go through here that the soil is really our gas tank when it comes to crops and irrigation. You put the water in, the crop takes the water out. Very much like you put gas into your car, you drive somewhere and you have to refill it again, the same thing happens with soil. So we need to know a little bit about soil and soil structure. Okay, we're going to talk about sprinklers and drip systems. I'll talk about both today. So, and both of them rely on soils uh, equally as importantly. So when we, look about, when we talk about soils, soils are usually made up of organics and minerals, uh, different kinds of texture, and when we have a saturated soil, what we have is no air in the soil. There's soil particles in water, not a very good situation for growing a crop, right? So what we're interested in is having a soil that is naturally drained. We either do that through natural processes or we use drainage. But we have what we call a sort of a, we're at field capacity. It's the amount of water that the soil can hold without gravity pulling it out, out the bottom of the root zone. And that's what we try to get to when we irrigate. We want to fill up the soil profile to field capacity. And it has a balance of soil, air, soil particles, air, and water in the soil mix. If you don't have any air in there, your roots can't grow. And so that is how much water we can apply. And different kinds of soils can store different amounts of water. So field capacity, right? That's our stored water. Just remember that as a term. I mentioned um, that different soils can store different amounts of water. So don't always go about what your neighbor does. Know what your own soils are. And a sandy soil can let the water in very quickly, but it can only store about an inch of water per foot of soil. And clay soils, for, on the other extreme, can store about two and a half inches of water per foot, but don't let the water in very quickly, which is a dilemma because we want the water to go in fast and we want lots of storage. We never get that with soils. So you have to keep these things kind of in mind. And I'll come back to this as we go along. So we're going to use an example in my, uh, to run through here kind of how you work out the gas tank and how you decide when to apply your water. And we're going to use sandy loam as an example and it stores one and a half inches of water per foot. Okay, so if we want to know how much water we can actually store for a particular crop, what we need to know is how deep do our crop roots go into the root zone? because that's going to tell us how big our gas tank is. Just like every vehicle has a different size gas tank, different soil crop combinations have a different size root zone, root volume that they can store water as well. And most of the water is taken up in the first half of the root zone because that's where most of your roots are. But it's also important to know exactly what the effective rooting depth of that crop is because there's a significant, a significant amount of water that gets taken out of the bottom half of the root zone as well. So we need to know the effective root depth of various crops. There are charts uh, available in those manuals I was referring to, and I'm sure Washington State has this as well. It tells us what the effective rooting depths are of different crops. And if you look at pasture species, grass, things like that, they're very shallow. You know, anywhere around one and a half feet, 18 inches. Moving over to raspberries, which would be about four feet, as, or what we call a deep-rooted crop. Alfalfa is also four feet. Blueberries is around two feet. So knowing a little bit about your rooting depth is very important about how you're going to manage your irrigation system. And if you don't know the rooting depth of your crop, maybe you should dig a hole and see where it is. And of course, and this is a key point, we irrigate and design our irrigation systems to where the crop is a mature crop. 
You plant a little blueberry plant, it's not at the full rooting depth yet. Your irrigation system has to be able to accommodate that when it's a mature crop, but you have to adjust your irrigation for a younger crop because the rooting depth isn't as deep, and so you wouldn't be putting on as much water. So, how much water can a soil store? Well, let's take raspberries as an example. We have a four foot rooting depth. We can store one and a half inches of water per foot of soil. So we can store a total of six inches of water field capacity in that gas tank. We have all, in that four feet of rooting depth, we have six inches of water. It says grass crop in the title, but I changed that. Uh, it should say raspberries. If we change this to, um, sorry, if we change this to a grass crop instead of raspberries, I could have used another crop too, like a vegetable crop, but I'm picking grass one and a half feet. Now we have a one and a half foot rooting depth, same soil. We can only store two and a quarter inches of water at field capacity versus the six inches for the raspberries. So there's a total different size gas tank that we're going to try to irrigate to. So if we can comparing this, six inches to two and a quarter inches, we're at about a third between those two crops. But there's a key thing here. When we're at field capacity, what we're saying, there's six inches of water in that soil for the raspberries, but the crop cannot take all of that water out. If it took all of the water out, we'd be at permanent wilting point, and just that word permanent wilting point tells you that we don't want to be at permanent wilting point because your plant is permanently wilted. So we want to take something less out, and so the question is, how much of that six inches can the crop take out? In the case, and we call this the availability coefficient. And for crops like alfalfa, grass, and raspberries, it's around 50%, sometimes 55% you'll see in the literature. But if you go to crops like potatoes or peas, they stress quicker, and so you can only take out about 35% of that gas tank before you have to replenish it, before you see the crop going into stress. So really what we're saying, your gas tanks become smaller because effectively the crop can only take less out. So we have to apply this factor. So if we look at um, the raspberry crop again, we said it was six inches. We can only take out half, so that would be three inches. So if we had let the soil dry down to that three inch mark or half the amount of water, and there's a presentation on soil moisture this afternoon that really will talk more to this. I, I won't talk much more about it, but there's a way of measuring this. If you get down to that point, you do not want to be applying more than three inches of water back into the soil with your irrigation system. Because if you do, you're just leaching out your nutrients, going to groundwater, you're wasting water. So it starts to tell, this number starts to tell you a lot, and I'll be demonstrating that shortly, how to run your irrigation system. If it was a grass crop, we could only put on about an inch of water before we're, uh, before we're done, compared to three inches for the raspberries. So now here, um, once we know how much water we can put in, what we also want to know is how fast is that going to be taken out of our gas tank? So we're storing three inches of water in the case of raspberries, but how quickly is that plant going to use it and it'll get to take that water back out again? And that's a term called peak evapotranspiration. If you go to um, websites or literature, you will see values like this, for, and I've listed British Columbia thing, you'll be close to Abbotsford. And usually, how do you guys uh, measure ET down here? Is it in inches per day or millimeters per day? Inches. Inches, inches. I know. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake, and I'll tell you why. Because, because we're Canadians and we're right, <laughs> but that's not the reason. We always did it in inches per day as well. So you'll see the values here is inch, in inches per day, and you'll see the conversion over into millimeters per day. If you go on to scientific literature and websites, they'll list the evapotranspiration in millimeters per day. You can convert 25.4 millimeters per inch. But here's the thing. You can determine your irrigation system flow rate by looking at what the water being taken out of the soil is. And 0.24 inches per day works out to six gallons per minute per acre. And that doesn't mean much to people. But as soon as you convert it over to millimeters, six millimeters per day is equal to six gallons per minute per acre, US gallons per minute. Four millimeters per day is four gallons per minute per acre. 
Seven millimeters per day is seven gallons per minute per acre. One millimeter per day is equal to one gallon per minute per acre. I've just given you guys a tool that you can use anywhere in the world to determine the maximum amount of flow that has to go to a farm running it 24-7. And nobody got onto that kind of a relationship because we were always working in the, in the inches per day value, but you convert it over to millimeters per day and you have a one-to-one -one relationship. I was in Australia, 100 acre farm, guys irrigating and I said to the guy, what's your ET here? He says, oh it's about, I won't use the Australian accent, oh it's about nine millimeters per day. How many acres you got? 100. So I said, so you're pumping around 900 gallons per minute? He goes, yeah, how do you know? <laughs> Works anywhere in the world. And in my job, when I worked at the Ministry of Agriculture, what do I get? I get a call from a farmer. says, Ted, I'm drilling a well. How much water do I need? What do you think I ask him? Number one, where do you live? I live in Castlegar. Okay, I said, okay, that's four, five millimeters per day. How many acres you got? Oh, I got 20. You need 100 gallons a minute, ideally. Done. That, just that simple. Now, irrigation system, drip system can use less. If I don't want to go 24-7, all these factors come in, but you can make those adjustments quickly. If you're going 24-7, which you should be doing if you're going to minimize your impact on streams and groundwater, because you're only taking what you really need, that's a really good number to go with. You guys will be at four millimeters per day in this area here. If you go to central Washington, it'll be a lot more. You can work out your flow rate that you need. And if you're running way higher than that, you better not be going 24-7. And you should be considering changing your systems over to something that runs 24-7 and getting back to within that flow rate so that we can start accommodating all these changes in hydrology that these guys have been talking about with our glaciers and, and flows. Right? So, a really, really neat tip. And I'm going to just quickly if I can do this fast, take you to a website called farmwest.com. It's uh, a website in British Columbia. We don't have Washington State. We do have um, weather stations all over the country, about a thousand of them. You can go to the weather station map to see that. But if I'm looking at Abbotsford Airport and I wanted to look at, say, the evapotranspiration from, and I'll just use the last few days, March the 1st to March the 6th, See if this thing works. Our total of evapotranspiration over the last six days was six millimeters or about 1.2 millimeters per day, which is probably about right. We're the winter time. In the summertime, it'll average at the peak in July and August around four. And that tells me that you need four gallons per minute per acre flow rate. So you can go to this website and we'll refer back to it. I just wanted you guys to see it. It's at farmwest.com. We used to have a few um, Washington State um, stations hooked up to it, but we don't anymore. Okay, so peak of that transpiration, keep that in mind. Now, if we... Um, <coughs> look at the maximum irrigation interval. How long do we have to go before we can come back? That's going to depend, of course, on how much water we put on. But if we irrigate to the total maximum soil water deficit, which is the amount of water we can store in our gas tank, and we look at the evapotranspiration rate, we divide that in, and it tells us how many days we can go before we have to come back. And I know this is all a little bit technical. Don't worry about it too much. You can read about it later. But the point is, in Abbotsford, for raspberries, we can go about 20 days between irrigations if we filled up the whole gas tank. For grass, we've got to be back in eight days if we filled up the whole gas tank. Does it matter if we get back for grass in eight days? No, grass will survive, it'll come back, right? Crops like raspberries, or other high value crops like blueberries, or potatoes, or peas, it will be important to come back if it's hot and dry, because if you don't, you're going to suffer on crop quality or production. So, let's talk a little bit about application efficiencies of our irrigation system. We obviously have to build this. That, four, that one millimeter per day equals one gallon per minute is built in. That is built in. The efficiencies are built in to that. So the number is your actual supply. Uh, obviously, if you're having a more efficient system, you can get by with not going 24-7 where else. So efficiencies are important in the design and operation of the system. But that rule of thumb that I gave you is very good about determining if you have enough water to irrigate your farm. 
So the, op the irrigation efficiency um, will change depending on the wind, operating pressure, sprinkler trajectory, time of day, hot or cool weather, maintenance, system type, all these things. If we look at solid set systems, the efficiency we would be using for design, and, and you should be for operation, is about 72%. The rate of the water that's applied by these kinds of systems will range anywhere from about 0.12 to 0.24 inches per hour, depending on your nozzle sprinkler arrangement, and I will show you that when I run the tool. For micro sprinklers, the efficiencies are a little higher, 80%. Same thing if they're inverted or not. Drip systems, very good efficiencies, anywhere from 90 to 95%, depending on how you've installed it using mulch and all that kind of stuff. Wheel lines or hand lines are like solid test systems. They're about 72%. <coughs> Traveling guns, not as good. Higher throw, higher pressure, drift. You can probably get 65% if you do a good job. But it's very easy to go less. Stationary guns. You should not be using these systems if you're concerned about water conservation and flows and irrigation. And I'll tell you why. Because the application rate is likely up around an inch per hour. Now think about it. Where do we really use these systems? They're being used on grass crops and pastures. What did I tell you how much water we could store on a grass crop? We can store one inch. This thing's putting out an inch per hour. How long should you run it? One hour. Anybody see anybody out there moving them every hour? Maybe every eight hours? Okay. Even if it's 0.5 inches per hour, you're moving this thing every three to four hours max, and that's never done. So you're wasting an awful lot of water with these systems unless you're out there all the time moving them around, which never happens. Center pivots, good efficiencies, especially now when we get into low pressure systems, drop nozzles, all that, we can get very uh, high, higher efficiencies. But we also have very high application rates, especially at the end tower, because the end tower is the one that's covering most of the ground and going more quickly. So it has to put a lot of water down in a very short period of time. So there's some challenges there on some of the heavier soils, like clays that can't absorb water as quickly. So things we have to look out for. So here are our numbers. Raspberries, three inches, grass, 1.1 inch. Remember, that's what we can store in the soil. We talked about the application rates of the systems, and I showed you the ranges on the slides that I just went through. And I mentioned that sand can't store water very much, but it can take it in at a very high rate of speed because it's a very porous soil, whereas clays can store a lot of water, but we can't apply it at a very high rate of speed, and so that can range anywhere from 0.75 to 0.25. If you have a cover crop, if you don't have a cover crop on bare ground, it'll actually be a little bit less. Don't worry about these numbers too much. So here's the crux. And you don't have to memorize this formula. The tool does it for you. If you want to write it down, it's fine. But to determine your application rate for your irrigation system is going to be equal to 96.3 times the flow rate of a full circle sprinkler divided by the spacing of your sprinklers. So let's say we have a, I'll use a hand line as an example here, but it could be a solid set or it could be a wheel line. And we have a, um, I just want to make sure, whoops. <coughs> so we have an area that's being applied. We have a bunch of nozzles. If we look at the nozzle across the top there, 964, so on, pressure of the nozzle will tell you the flow rate. So a very common application is a 532nd in nozzle running at 50 pounds pressure, puts out five gallons per minute. Okay? If our sprinkler, sprinkler spacing was a 40 by 60, which it quite often is on a wheel line, and we have the five gallon per minute nozzle, we're putting on about 0.2 inches per hour. That's the application rate. So all those tables are available in, in, from various sources. You can get it, or you can do the formula to calculate it yourselves. So with a hand line or wheel line, it depends on how much you're going to apply it, depending on how many times a day you're going to move it. If you move it once per day, you have a longer set time, you'll put on more water. You see at the bottom here, one move per day at a five gallon per minute nozzle, running it for 11 and a half hours, putting on 3.4 inches. If you put on two moves per day, sorry, that would be 23 hours, two moves per day, 11 and a half hours, 1.7 inches. So it's, it's about the math, 
for determining how fast our irrigation system is putting the water on to what's going into the reservoir to determine how much fast, how fast the, the crop, crop's taking that out to see how far we can go across the field before we have to get back again. That's kind of where all this math is heading, right? I won't go through uh, other examples here because um, we don't have time. So, I mentioned the evapotranspiration, the seven millimeters per day, the four millimeters per day thing. It's all, um, you get that from a weather station. So here's a really good question for the group here. When somebody asks you what goes into evapotranspiration, think weather station. Evapotranspiration is solar radiation, transportation, relative humidity, temperature, wind. It is not crop. It is not soils. Because the weather station never knows what crop or soils are there. But it knows all these other things. So you get the evapotranspiration from the weather station, and then you adjust those numbers for the type of crop with crop coefficients. But a lot of people start throwing soils and crops into your evapotranspiration. Yes, it's affected by that, but it is not the reference evapotranspiration, right? There's a whole hour on this in our courses, so I'm just doing this real quick. But So let's run through a quick example. Solid set sprinkler, 40 by 50 spacing, 60 foot, um, 11 64th inch nozzles at 50 psi, 11 64th nozzle at 50 psi, 6.1 gallons per minute. Um, sorry, you know what? When our, when our, no, just a sec. We corrupted our file when we were loading it this morning. It corrupted, and what happened is it pulled back the old file because I had changed these numbers um, for today, but the file got corrupted in trying to load it on this computer this morning. So. Some of these things might be a little bit wrong because the, the old file that I've used in another presentation months ago has been pulled forward. But that won't matter if we just look at what's on the right-hand side here. Five gallons per minute, 96.3 on that spacing. We're putting on 0.24 inches per hour. 0.24 inches per hour for 12 hours because it's solid set. We move from one valve to the other very quickly. We're putting on roughly three inches of water three inches of water at that 72% efficiency for the sprinkler system because we can't get it all in the soil. Some of it's evaporating. I mean, we're putting on a net amount of water of roughly two inches. If our gas tank can store more than two inches, that will be fine. So the raspberries that could store three, that's going to be fine. The grass that can only store one, that's not going to be fine because we're putting on two, right? That's how you have to think about that. So 2.1 inches, and I'm going back now, we have to go back to the U.S. term of 0.15 inches per day rather than the 4 millimeters per day because we have to stick the terms together. Means if we're putting on 2 inches of water and we're using it up at 0.15 inches per day, 14 days later, this water will be gone. And we'll have to come back and irrigate again, providing we haven't had rainfall or whatever else, right? And that the evapotranspiration was at 0.5 inches all that time over the 14 days. So that may not be the case. Okay, that was a lot of math. It's simple math. It's hard to understand some of these concepts. And that's why I'm going to show you a tool uh, in a bit. But before I do that, I just want to go through drip irrigation. And I know some of you guys are irrigating blueberries or other crops with drip. It's a whole different concept now. And by the way, what I'm telling, talking to you guys about here in an hour is a two-day course when you're talking to irrigation designers. So don't feel like I didn't quite follow everything. This is a long thing that we have to go through to fully understand all these things. I'm going through it very quickly, just giving you the concept, right? So with drip irrigation, the whole intent of drip irrigation, I just talked about a sprinkler, you know, we irrigate over here, we fill up the soil profile to the gas tank, we move it across our field, the gas tank goes down, and then we come back 14 days later and we irrigate it again. And what's happening is the soil moisture is going down, 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 and then we have to fill it back up again. With drip irrigation, we don't do that. We want to keep the soil moisture at the optimum level so the plant does really good. And we'll irrigate it every day or two. And we'll put on a little bit of water every, other, every day or every other day to keep that plant happy with the amount of water that it gets. Any idea what the runtime for a blueberry crop here is? This area should be? Nobody's going to volunteer? Okay, that is a good question that a lot of people can't answer. 
And it's a really good question if you change to a different crop, say, well, what should my run time be? This, um, I'll show you how we calculate it, and then I'll show you the tool that we use that, that you can use that can give you that answer very quickly as well. So, with drip irrigation, we change the concept. Since we're irrigating the plant, I'm no longer really concerned about the entire field, because I figure if I can give this one plant the amount of water that it needs to do well, and I do the same thing for all the other plants that are the same as this one plant, I'm doing a good job. So I'm just going to look at the one plant. Okay, so if we're looking, what we really want to know is how many gallons of water does this plant need every day? If I can work that out, I've got the information that I need. So there's a little bit of a complicated formula. It's, uh, the formula is gallons per day times the conversion factor is 0.623 times the plant area. Just explain this a little bit. 0.623 times the plant area, times our term of evapotranspiration, our peak evapotranspiration, times a crop factor, crop coefficient, that's going to change this area uh, and, um, and the ET to something that the plant needs, and we have those values for you, times the soil storage factor. And the soil storage factor is important because if we have lots of moisture stored in our soil, and our drip irrigation system cannot keep up at the very peak time of the year, it doesn't matter because we can rely on the soil storage. So we can actually derate how much we actually have to put on because we have a soil storage to back us up. If we can't store a lot of water in the soil, we don't want to derate it too much. We want to make sure the system can put on that amount of water all the time. Okay? So that's how we go through this calculation. So, this is sort of putting it pictorially, evapotranspiration, soil storage, plant area, crop coefficient factor. Those are all the factors we have to have. So I'm going to pick a blueberry farm in Linden, grown on a sandy loam soil. I'm going to irrigate this blueberry crop with 0.5 gallon per hour drippers, spaced two and a half feet apart. So there's two and a half emitters per plant is what I'm saying. The blueberry plants are spaced five feet by 10 feet. That may be true or may not, but this is my farm. This is the way I decided to do it. So, putting those numbers into the formula, I know my peak ET right here is 0.15 inches per day. I already picked that up. The plant area is 50 square feet. The crop coefficient factor for blueberries is 0.8. And my soil storage factor is 0.75. I've calculated that already. I'm not going to go into detail how I did that, but there's a methodology in our manuals to do that. So I need about 2.8 gallons per plant every day in the middle of the summer when it's hot. I have to think about some other things. There's going to be some leaching. I don't want to only do that. I want to have the capability of leaching some water out so I can move salts away from my root zone. I have an application efficiency for my drip system. I have, it's not 100%. It's 90%. I have to take that into account. And I want to look at my system design. What's the emission uniformity of my drip system? Are all the emitters putting on exactly the amount of, same amount of water? And that's not likely the case because the emitter that's closer to the beginning of the zone might be putting on a little bit more water than the emitter that's at the end of the zone or the emitter that's going up a little bit in elevation or the emitter that might be slightly plugged or all of that. So I have to determine what my emission uniformity out of each emitter is and we try to design to an emission uniformity of 80%. Some systems you can get to 90%. If you're less than 80%, you should redo your irrigation system. And you can check this on your own system. Go out there, stick a catch can on your emitters along the lines through the zone, run it for a half an hour, go back and collect the water and see if they're the same. And the more emitters you have, the bigger sample you have, you can catch, capture this uniformity. So something you can measure and something you should do if you have an old system. Or if you want to check on your irrigation guys to see if they've done a good job go out there and monitor and say, how come my emitter at the end there is giving half the water the one at the beginning? It shouldn't be doing that, right? So these factors we have to put into the, the formula to make sure that we can supply enough water. So adding all those, leaching, not too worried about it down here. We, except for this year, get enough winter rainfall to leach things out. So it's not an issue, but if you're in the Okanagan Valley where it's hot and dry, you don't get a lot of precipitation, you might want to have a leaching factor built in. Our efficiencies, 93, 95%, probably in that range, 90%. Our emission uniformity, I'm picking 0.85 for this example. So I plug those into the formula, 
my 2.8 gallons became 3.7 gallons. I got to make sure I could put 3.7 gallons onto every plant every day. I have two emitters per plant. They're putting out 0.5 gallons per hour each for a total of one. My 3.7 gallons per day for one gallon per hour per plant is 3.7 hours per day. And somebody here said four. Pretty darn close. If you're running at four, don't change anything. Monitor your soil moisture. You can make adjustments, right? Now here's the thing. This is the neat scheduling thing. 0.15 inches per day is roughly 3.7 millimeters per day. Okay, that doesn't translate into here, it's just fluke. Don't think that you can get the hours per day by using millimeters per day. Our millimeters per day, ET, goes into gallons per minute per acre. It doesn't go into gallons per hour or runtime per plant. That's just a fluke, so don't think that's the way it is. But what I'm saying is this. In this particular example, that is about 3.7 millimeters per day. You can round it off to four, that's fine. So you say, okay, my runtime is roughly four hours per day for four millimeters per day. I go to Farm West. It's May. I click on the site. It says, like we did today, it's one millimeter per day. If you were going to be irrigating today because you needed to and you wanted to keep up, your runtime would be one hour per day because we're getting, we're getting one millimeter per day of evapotranspiration. Now, we wouldn't be doing that. But in May and June, if it was hot and dry, you would want to irrigate. And when you run your drip system, you're going to say, what is my runtime going to be? It's four hours per day in the middle of summer. What is it today? Check the website. Millimeters are two. It's two hours per day. So you have a very quick schedule once you know your runtime based on your design ET. And it just so happens for blueberries, and that won't be the case for raspberries or other crops, or it may not even be the case for your crop, depending on the emitters and all the other things you put in. But in our example, we're almost on a direct relationship with 3.7 hours per day to 3.7 millimeters per day. So if it's 2.2 millimeters, it's 2.2 hours. Just fluky for my example. But you can schedule that way very quickly yourself. OK, so I'm going to demonstrate a tool. And I went through this very quickly. But I'm now going to demonstrate a tool that will do all of this for you. You don't have to go through the math. It's called the Agriculture Irrigation Scheduling Calculator. It works in real time. It connects to all the weather stations in British Columbia. So if you're close to one of those weather stations, you just click on that weather station. It pulls in the data. It gives you the schedule. I'll show you how it works. You need an account. It's free. You just have to register. So if you're a new person, you would register on the register new account and, and register yourself. You can get to this website by going to irrigationbc.com, which is the Irrigation Association's website. This just says that you can't sue me. Something goes wrong. These are all my scenarios. You can create your own scenarios and store them. So you don't have to go back and do all the work every time. You just got to click on the the today's date, and boom, it tells you the new number, right? I'm going to do a wheel line system. And you'll notice on this site, there are four tabs. And we've talked about them. Crop, soils, irrigation design, and climate. That's all you need to do the thing. And this is how fast you can do it. You select your crop. I've picked corn in this case. Okay? But you can pick any crop you want off the list. When you pick your crop, it gives you the soil type. It gives you your availability coefficient. All of that automatically gets loaded in here. You don't have to do anything. You just got to pick your crop. That's pretty easy. You've done tab number one. Tab number two, you've got to pick your soil. Now, what happens here if I take this soil layer and I remove it? A red flag comes up and says, you said you had a deep-rooted crop of four feet, but you're only giving me two feet of soil. That can't work. So go change your crop rooting depth or add some more soil. So I say, oops, I don't have enough soil in here. So I'll go over here, add another layer of soil. Say it's uh, 24 inches in depth. Add that layer. I've now got four feet of soil. The calculator's happy. Calculates how much water can be stored in the gas tank all automatically. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's all there. 
Okay, so that's done. I need to know a little bit about my irrigation system. It's 40 feet by 60 feet. I need to know the size of my field. It's saying it's 18 sets. It's taking 18 moves to get across that field. I'm setting it for 11 and a half hours each. I pick off my, um, my nozzle type and the pressure that it's running. When I do that, it automatically comes up with a, I haven't done it yet, six gallons per minute is what the no flow rate of the nozzle is. It says, oh, Ted, the application rate for this irrigation system is exceeding the maximum application rate for the soil. It's probably going to cause some runoff. So I have a problem here. Well, you know what? I'll go to a smaller nozzle. Let's see if I get that same thing. Oh, it's happy because I'm putting on less water and I'm not going to have any runoff. Now, you shouldn't have to be doing that because your designer's done all of that. You just got to enter the information in the calculator that he gives you on your irrigation design. Okay, so now I've got all my irrigation and system information in there, and now I go to my scheduling. And for some reason, I'm not getting this. The flow rate was zero, I think. Is that what it was? Yeah. Thank you. See, somebody's paying attention to this thing. Oh, yeah, I still got to pick a, a pressure. Okay, here we go. So roughly four and a half gallons per minute on that system. Now, let's go ahead. It should have prompted me saying you did something wrong. Okay, so I picked my weather station. I'll go to Abbotsford Airport, closest one to me. Um, I'm going to run this thing, because it's the middle of March, just to see if it gives me historical data. I'll go back and say I started on July the 23rd. And it comes back and says, at that time of year, last year, I've, oops, what do I do now? Let's do that again. Okay. If I look at that, last summer, at that time, it tells me I've gone across my field because it says here's all my sets across the field that I've picked. Where I've just finished irrigating, I've got water. Where I started, it's dry. So I better be irrigating right away, and that's what it says right there. If it says, if there was blue all the way across here, it would say, you still got water where you started. You don't have to irrigate for another three days. It also looks into the forecast of ET for the next five days, so it tells you whether you need to irrigate or not, and it prompts you. You don't have to start yet, wait. Through. If it says five plus, it means we forecasted for five days, sorry, and it might be longer than that, so come back and check again. If it says two days, you say, I could wait two more days, and then it starts. Now, this is based on climate. What I don't know is what's really happening in the soil, and I'm making some guesses on this. So this is where this afternoon when we start talking about soil moisture really starts to back this up. If your soil moisture probe also says at that time, time to irrigate, then you know your parameters you got into the climate data and all that are working very well. It's a good way to double check. Okay, so you'll get the prompt right here as to what happens and, and what you have to do. Very neat tool. Uh, of course, you have to put all the right data in because if the right data doesn't go in, it, it calculates based on wrong data. So let's go to uh, a drip system. And I've been having problems with this drip system because it won't go back in historical data. That's the problem with it. But this, right now, and I don't know why, um, apples, we're going to pick apples, medium density. It pulls in all the factors just like before. We go to soils. We put in the soils information just like before. But now, and this is a key thing in using this calculator. There's a little bit of, there's, there are PDFs online. It's at irrigationbc.com. So let's say you're running a drip system with point source emitters. You can download the PDF and start tech, tells you a little bit more detail of how do we run the calculator, because the calculator has to know what kind of system you're running to pull up the right screen. So at the very beginning, when you build a scenario, you say, I'm going to do it for my blueberry field on the back 40. You have to pick the kind of irrigation system you're going to need on using on that. So the calculator loads the proper screens or the, you know, the tables that you have to fill out to make it run. Because it doesn't know all of a sudden to say, yeah, I want to run a sprinkler system. If you're right in here, it says you can't get to sprinkler. You've got to go right back to the beginning. So you always got to say what kind of system you're going to run. Okay, I've got two emitters per plant on these trees. 
In this case, they're one gallon per hour. I'm running them every day. I'm estimating my system run time to be four hours. Um, it gives me my efficiencies. Let's see if I can get um, a run time here. I've got to go back to Abbotsford. That's another thing we're going to change. And I, if I have problems here, I'm going to see if I can run it in real time. We're working with our developer on this right now, so uh, trying to get this fixed. There you go. It works in real time. I can't get it to work in historical time. So for you guys, it won't matter because you're supposedly only using it in real time. I want to demonstrate it, so I want to go back to a summertime, right? So what it tells me for these conditions, uh, Abbotsford Airport, running tree fruits in real time, it says my run time, and it changes by day depending on the ET. So you can see what, for the next few days, kind of what the run time would be. If this was in the middle of the summer, for tree fruits, your run time might be around five, six hours. Um, you would sort of say, hey, it's around that range. So you could set the clock for the week saying, I got to set it for five hours a day for this week or 10 hours every other day for this week or whatever you want to do. But you have a schedule. Now you take your soil moisture monitoring devices and say, if I set my clock to this schedule and I follow that, Am I getting my soil to become wetter over that time period, drier, or just about the same? And if my soil moisture readings stay just about the same, you know that this thing is bang on. If it's not, then you have to make an adjustment to it. But over time, you'll say, hey, you know what? The data that my calculator has given me is always out by 0.8 one way or another, let's say. And you make that adjustment when you put it into the clock. So you have a, two methods of scheduling. Climb up that method which is hard for an individual farmer to do because how are you getting your climate, how are you making it all work out. And the soil moisture method, which we'll talk about, somebody's going to talk about this afternoon, which is right there what's happening on your farm and you can use that for scheduling too. So between the two tools, you can do a really good job. Okay, so I have, I have lots of stories around that actually. Uh, maybe we'll tell the one story that, um, have we got a bit of time? 10 minutes or so? Oh, 10, minutes, yeah. 10 minutes, okay. I'll get this done in 10 minutes. Southeast Colonial Irrigation District. We had uh, a metering program go in there back in the middle 1990s because they're concerned about water supply. So we put the meters in, we gave all the farmers uh, soil moisture monitoring devices to monitor their soil moisture. Nobody was interested in the meters. They're all peeved off about it. Nobody wanted the soil moisture and measuring devices. But we found 10 producers that we were going to work with to show them how it's going to work and make sure they're on the schedule, not use too much water and all that. Um, we, made, we got smart. We hired a young college student. She was pretty good, very good looking girl as well. And the farmers didn't mind her coming out every week to tell them what to do. <laughs> and that helped a lot because the farmers that were actually listening to what she was giving were almost bang on on their schedule. When she would say, you don't have to water for another three days, and they didn't, and they said, now it's time to water. And she went out about twice a week. So they started following the schedule according to the soil moisture that was in the ground, listening to what she had to say. And at the end of the day, at the end of the year, uh, the, year the one farmer was bang on with his water, what we calculated it should be. He was exactly on to the point where we said, and I'm going to talk about millimeters, he needed 710 millimeters. He would be at 709. It was that accurate two years in a row. So it worked really, really well, right? The problem we had was getting other producers to adopt technology and follow it along because it's extra work. And that, I agree, it's, it's a little bit harder. The other part of that story is if um, the farmers didn't want the meters, forecast five years later to 2003, that hot, dry summer when Kelowna almost burned down, um, Southeast Kelowna did not have to do much to manage their water. They just set how much water each farmer was going to get, and they got through that year fine. Other districts were under stress and under a lot of trouble with their water management. And the following year, a lot of them started going into the metering as well, just like Southeast Kelowna did, who already had it. And now those farmers that had it, that didn't want it, thought to themselves, wow, we actually do have a pretty good management system for us. So kind of a good news story in a way. I want to talk about one other quick thing that is also really cool, and it ties into the presentations that you just heard this morning. In BC, we have got a 
tool that we've developed called the Agriculture Water Demand Model. I have some reports right here, these two reports that are right here, if people want to look through them. There's just a bunch of numbers. You don't really have to. I'll explain quickly what that tool is about. It started in the Okanagan because we're, in the Okanagan, we estimated 70% of the water went to agriculture, and it's a lot of people moving into the Okanagan, and we're concerned that we're not going to be able to maintain our water for agriculture, and people are going to try to take it, and we didn't really know how much we needed. So we came up with the idea of developing a tool that will calculate how much water agriculture needs today, and how much we're going to need in the future. And the way the tool works is that we go out and survey every farm, and for every farm in the Okanagan Valley, we know exactly where they're growing their tree fruits, their grapes, their grass, by polygons on each farm. Some of the farms would have 10 polygons on it, saying this is where, and, how, and so we know exactly the acres of everything on each farm. So if you think back to my previous little thing about how we calculate demand, we need to know the crop. We knew the crop, exactly where it was in a GIS format. We knew the soils because we had a soil layer. We developed a climate layer that was on a 500 meter grid that covered the entire Okanagan Basin that provided daily climate data from 1961 to 2010, daily. So we know the evapotranspiration rate daily. And we have 12 climate models that projected to the year 2100. So we have 12 climate models with daily data going to the year 2100 on a 500 meter grid over the entire Okanagan. And that allowed us to calculate very accurately how much water we need for agriculture. And so what the model does is it calculates and says the crop is going to start growing on say May the 10th, and then it says it's apples, and for that little polygon it says okay, we're going to track it through the year, we know what the ET is, we apply the crop coefficient for every day so we adjust it daily, we add up every day's data for that crop, add that total, do all the other crops on that farm, do that total, add up all those for the farm, get that total, add up all the farms for the entire valley, get that total, and in three minutes we know it's exactly 165 million cubic meters. Really neat tool. It was so neat that um, we now have done the entire Fraser Valley, we've done the entire Thompson, we've done the Kettle Valley. Washington State is interested in Kettle Valley information because of the Bonneville Power Administration wants to know how much water we need. We haven't given them the data yet, but they're asking for it. And we're doing the rest of the province as well. So we'll have a tool, we've done Vancouver Island, we'll have a tool where we can calculate what our agriculture needs are today and what they're going to need to be in the future. That we can ask the tool things like take all the all the grass crops growing on a sandy soil, convert them over to grapes, put in a drip system, what would the demand be? What would be the demand in 2050? So it gives us answers very quickly as to this question that's kind of being asked, how much water does agriculture need? You, we can do that. In Metro Vancouver, these green areas are all the farms that are irrigating today. The red are all the farms that could be irrigating in the future if we supplied them with water. There's an awful lot of red. What we also found out was that there's more land irrigated in the Fraser Valley than there is in the Okanagan. And if you guys know anything about British Columbia, everybody thinks about the Okanagan irrigation because you have to irrigate up there. But we have more land in the Fraser Valley, 28,000 hectares of irrigated land in the Fraser Valley compared to um, 20,000 in the Okanagan. So we know about the climate change thing. But here's some cool results from the model for Metro Vancouver. In Metro Vancouver, we have, in 2013, 11,000 hectares of land, irrigated land getting water from surface water sources, primarily the rivers like the Fraser River. 1,300 1, hectares of groundwater for a total of 13,000. Our water demand is 60 million cubic meters in Metro Vancouver in 2013, 2003, which was the hot, dry year. But in 1997, which was a cool, wet year, we only needed 36 million cubic meters. So you can see there's a real fluctuation in water demand depending on the time of year. But in 1997, when we don't need lots, much water, we have lots of water. It's a cool, wet year. In 2003, when we need a lot of water, we don't have a lot of water because it's a hot, dry year. So it's it's it really starts to challenge us when we look over time. These global climate models, I'm only showing three. 
we're projecting forward to the 2050s, you get a real range of numbers. The peak that this model tells us is 74.2 over 60, and this is with no changes on crops or land use or anything else. So it's the same crop or land use. We'll go from 60 to 74. This model says 77. This model says a peak of 99. On average, they're giving us these numbers. Um, so 37% increase can happen more often. On average, it's probably going to be an 11% increase. So what we know is we're going to need more water going into the future, and we can use the results from this modeling to help us do the planning that we need to do to secure water for agriculture in the future, because this becomes a key part of it. This is my last slide. You have to take this, you have to realize this, is that when you model into the future, to get a really good uh, result, you have to take all of our 12 global climate models and run them all for every year from 1960 to the year 2100 to get any one kind of a trend. So when I just showed you those numbers, they, those are out, they could be outliers, they could be anywhere on this whole scheme of things. So you could have a wide range. When you run all of them, you get a trend line, and we've only done that in the Okanagan. And we show about a 15, 11 to 15 percent increase in demand over time. That's not bad. That's actually pretty good if that's going to happen on average because we know we can improve our irrigation efficiencies by at least 15% and our management of irrigation. So we can accommodate that. The problem is trying to bring in new land and the problem is the extreme years. You're going to get these extreme years where it's going to be really hot and dry and instead of them happening once like 2003, they might happen three or four times in a span of 10 years in 2050. That's going to be harder to accommodate. So with that, I'll turn it back to yeah, lunchtime, I guess, eh? Yeah, questions? Yeah.